POV, you're CJ Stroud, and you're about to get drafted into the NFL. The reason for that being is because you're very good at throwing a football. Makes sense, because you're a quarterback. However, before that can actually happen, teams also want to make sure you're good from behind a keyboard. Today, we're going to talk about three bizarre ways that teams and the internet evaluate quarterbacks and how C.J. Stroud's success will hopefully bring some sanity to the process. C.J. Stroud, like many Ohio State quarterbacks before him, put up incredible numbers in college. In his first season as starter, he managed to throw 44 TDs, and in his second, he added another 41. The meager drop-off in his second season is actually quite impressive when you realize he did it without Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, who left for the NFL, and Jackson Smith and Jigba, who was out for most of the year with an injury. Even more impressively, he managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Georgia in their much-lauded defense. Throwing for four touchdowns in the college semifinals that year. But as I mentioned earlier, Stroud wasn't the first Ohio State quarterback to put up crazy stats, which made it very easy for some to label him as a college only thrower of the football. You hear this one a lot when it comes to QB evaluation. It's largely stuck because, quite frankly, the college ranks have produced many high profile duds. Tim Couch and Danny Werfel come to mind. Maybe Tim Tebow if you're being very generous. Because if we're being honest, he was always better suited for the Leatherhead era. Out of all the high profile duds though, I'd say Tim Couch is the touchstone. Famously, he learned the air raid offense over some wings at Hooters. Though the wings probably didn't have as much to do with it as the people who were jotting down smash concepts on napkins. While at Kentucky, he had the great fortune of being not only coached by Hal Mumi, his offensive coordinator was Mike Leach, RIP. Under that brain trust, he managed to throw for almost 4,300 yards and 36 touchdowns in just 11 games in his final season for the Wildcats. Couch went first overall to the Browns and it didn't go well because when does anything go well for the Browns? Couch struggled to adapt to the NFL style offenses like the West Coast. Some believed he was merely a product of the simple reads that the air raid offense gives you. Though others pointed out that he was basically playing for an expansion team. More recently, Ohio State has become the de facto home of this argument. Quarterbacks like Cardale Jones, Dwayne Haskins, RIP, and Justin Fields have all struggled in their transition to the NFL, despite putting gaudy numbers up while at Ohio State. As you can see, there are tons of examples of these quarterbacks, and it appears to be still happening. But there's one really big problem with this argument. It's that there's a ton of examples of quarterbacks who played in college-friendly offenses and yet transitioned to the NFL seamlessly. One example is Deshaun Watson before the, you know, he was thought of to be a product of Dabble Swinney. Patrick Mahomes was just an air raid guy. Hell, even some wondered if Trevor Lawrence would have issues learning an NFL offense. Yet all those guys have proved the doubters wrong. And I know what you're thinking, none of those guys went to Ohio State. This is a variant of the college only argument and it's arguably even more bizarre. It essentially posits that the particular type of spread offense that they run at Ohio State produces quarterbacks who will not be able to succeed in the NFL. The of the argument is the recruiting advantage that Ohio State has, which allows their quarterbacks to throw to wide open receivers who are a lot faster than everyone else lining up against. Either way, it doesn't really matter because there's nothing inherent to the playbook or even the recruiting advantage that makes a quarterback that comes out of the school bad. If you're looking for reasons why Justin Fields is bad, I wouldn't point to his time at OS. Probably has more to do with Matt Eberflus, but I digress. The point being here that teams need to stop judging quarterbacks by their college playbooks. Okay, this is my most controversial take. I think watching college film is a borderline waste of And I say this as someone who watches a lot of 
YouTubers who go into great depth and come up with great analysis of prospects. My problem isn't with the quality of the analysis so much as how seriously it's taken. For example, Justin Herbert. Many a YouTuber humble bragged about how much tape they watched of Justin Herbert just to get a read of how good he actually was. All of them came to the consensus that he cannot get through progressions properly and the coaching staff doesn't trust him. From their vantage point, that seems correct. You watch a quarterback, he's struggling to make the right reads and you're like, okay, he clearly isn't good at it. But we literally have no idea what's going on. How good or bad the coaching is, how good the talent is around anybody, anything. And the thing is, it doesn't matter how many times you watched Justin Herbert failed at reading a progression on tape. It still doesn't tell you that. There's frankly way too many variables to make any kind of conclusive statement. And yet so many people do. Even after Justin Herbert has gone from being a football dummy to nose ball. To bring it back to Ohio State, CJ Stroud was accused of not looking good on tape. So far, he's looked pretty good in the NFL. However, the Ohio State quarterback I want to talk about right now is Joe Burrow. Burrow obviously had to transfer to LSU where he won a national championship because he couldn't win the starting job there. Burrow was considered very good at going through his progressions and has diced up NFL offenses for a few years now. But imagine if he had stuck around at Ohio State. Would he have put anything on tape that made you think that he was good at that? Maybe it wouldn't have been as bad as the Justin Herbert tape. But it'd be probably a lot of easy throws. That's why I don't think watching college tape is the greatest use of time. Especially for quarterbacks. And sure, you can learn a lot about the game from watching it, but you're really just doing it for yourself ultimately. And if you happen to get it right, you're just lucky. You're better off trying to figure out talent. What are prospects best at athletically? and then hope it clicks when it gets to the next level. The NFL writ large definitely covets speed and size, but believe it or not, it covets brains too. For years, the NFL gave long shrift to the Wonderlick, a glorified IQ test that's supposed to gauge how you can think on your feet. NFL journeyman Ryan Fitzpatrick famously has one of the highest scores ever, though the test popularity has waned in recent years. Maybe because Carson Wentz scored in the top 10 ever. Seven points higher than Tom Brady. And as you can see with his famous interceptions, he's not particularly good on his feet. That hasn't stopped the NFL though. They still want to know how well a quarterback can read his progressions without actually having to physically go through them. The latest NFL brain fad is the S2 cognition test. During the draft, I did a video on Bryce Young versus CJ Stroud, and I described it as the Wonderlick meets brain games meets video games, and also said, like most grifts, it's worked recently. Quarterbacks sit in front of a laptop and then basically click on diamonds or whatever and records reactions in two milliseconds. Apparently Brock Purdy scored very well on this. Purdy's success probably has more to do with that team, Kyle Shanahan, and his own ball placement. The teams wanting to know how they could find the next Brock Purdy started taking this test really seriously. So much so that when a poor score leaked for CJ Stroud, it all but cemented Bryce Young as the number one pick. About halfway into their rookie seasons, CJ so far has proven to be much better in terms of getting through his progressions and making the right reads. In fact, Bryce Young has been making mistakes that he wasn't making in college, like those first interceptions he threw. Reportedly, Stroud scored in the 18th percentile in the test, while Bryce Young scored 98. This whole cognition test fad reminds me of how my first year psych prof used to scoff at sites like Lumosity that had these brain games that claim to improve your English language skills. What actually happens is you just get better at those games when you play them. They have no transferable skills. 
So in other words, if it doesn't work out for Bryce Young, I don't think his height will be a problem on the Pro S2 test circuit. So I think after all the hubbub surrounding CJ Stroud and his draft status, and how he would rise and fall depending on how people perceived his film or whatever he did on a test, I think the Royal we needs to throw out any arguments about college offenses or the college they went to or how they look going through their progressions on tape or how they did on the next brain game fad. Focus more on objectively quantifiable things like their athleticism or accuracy. And for as much flack as the NFL Combine gets for being the underwear Olympics, I do think it's kind of useful in some ways, or at least Stroud figure out how to make it useful. He showed up and didn't do anything that did not revolve around showing off his arm. I'll take that over obsessing over how many objects an athlete can keep track of at the same time. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, apologies for the sound of my voice. I, uh, I decided to battle through it in my home style. Hopefully I did better than you did last week.